All right. So when I was a freshman in high school, my, um, my folks went out of town uh, in the summer, and um, I don't know where my brothers were. I have, like, I have to, I don't know where they were, but it was just me going to stay home. And, um, you know, they said what parents typically do. Hey, make sure you take care of all these things. So make sure you feed the dogs. Uh, sprinklers are on. Make sure they, they hit what they need to heat. We had a ton of hit what they need to hit. Uh, we have a ton of fruit trees and stuff. So they said make sure they're all working um, and make sure to water the peach tree because the sprinkler doesn't water the peach tree as much as it needs to be watered. So make sure you water that. I said, got it. You know what I wish they would have said to me? I wish they would have said, do not water the peach tree. Just let it die. Because guess what? I didn't water the peach tree, and it died. Yeah, so they came home like, how'd it go? That was great. Awesome. You know, everything's good. I thought everything's great. Took care of the pool, the dogs. It was awesome. Until Dad walked out and looked at the peach tree and goes, huh, hey, Greg, come on out. Right? Like, oh, yeah, we got the peach tree. Yeah, it's kind of funny how that works, right? If we, want our, if, if we want trees to produce good fruit, we have to keep them alive, right? Yes. But here's what's funny. If we want the Holy Spirit to produce good fruit in our lives, we have to die. Right? That's what Jesus tells us. That, that's what Taylor read to us today. If we want the Spirit to produce good fruit in our lives, we have to die. Here's what Jesus says in Matthew 8. You've got it there, hopefully in front of you. You didn't close your Bible. He, he writes this. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. See, this is the paradox of Christianity, right? That if we want to live, that we actually need to die. The only way for us to truly live the life that, that Christ has called us to is to die to ourselves, to pick up our cross. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's not, hey, here we go. It's every single day we need to die to ourselves, deny ourselves, pick up our cross, and die with Christ. And when we do that, then the Spirit produces fruit in our lives. Right? So when, we're, when we die with Christ, then the Spirit can produce in us this fruit, the fruit that we're talking about in our series, this fruit of the Spirit. It's only when we die that He is able to, to do that. The primary work um, of the Spirit, right, the primary work of the Spirit in our lives is, is, is to work this fruit, but really it's to, it's to sanctify us, right? The fancy church word for making us holy, setting us apart. In essence, making us more like Christ, right? So as we die with Christ, the Spirit then makes us more into, makes us more like Christ. Here's what Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians. He says, um, that will become becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. See, this is what the Spirit works in us, that, that we are attaining the full measure of the fullness of Christ. It's the fruit of the Spirit, as we talk about it throughout this series, it's really the, the outward expression of Christ dwelling in us. Right? Be, does Christ live in us? Yes. Right? That, that, that's the promise, right? I no longer live, but Christ lives in me, Paul, Paul writes. It is the Spirit who lives in me. The fruit of the Spirit is the expression of that reality. It is the Spirit living out through us the reality of Christ dwelling in us. Right? So what, is the spirit, what does this fruit look like? We, we, we read about it, but what is it really, and what does it really— because we can say, oh, be, be loving, be kind— you know, be at peace, have peace, be joyful, woo, and, and go on. But so today we're going to take a look at the fruit of the Spirit and kind of dig into it a little bit more um, and, and see what, what, what that is and what it means, um, what it looks like in our lives. So, but the first thing we have to get clear is that we need to die, we need to die to, we need to die to every day what it is that Christ died for, right? So we need to die to every day what it is that Christ died for, and what did Christ die for? Our sin right? So it starts there. It starts with us dying every day to self in order, in order for the Spirit to, to grow this fruit in our lives. So in your bulletin, I don't really, I don't do this very often, but I did it this time. I just got a wild hair, I guess. So there's a, uh, there's a uh, insert in your bulletin if you want to take it out that just has the, the, I spent a lot of time on this, you can tell. It just has the fruits listed there. So if you want to take notes, go ahead and do that. Uh, if you don't want to take notes, doodle away um, or make an airplane later on. Um, but here we go, right? So let's start out here. It starts out with love. Now, love is, love, love, love is the summation of the law. If we read through uh, Galatians, that's what Paul says, right? That's what Jesus said. So Paul's really just quoting that. Uh, well, he's really quoting the Old Testament. But love is, is the summation 
of the law, but it's also the defining characteristic of our, of our life in Christ. Now, you and I, humanity, we have a hard time really um, defining or describing love because we use love for so many different things, so many, like, opposite end of the spectrum things almost. Like, I love pizza, right? And, of course, love my wife. So it's just kind of weird there. So where, where we have problems really defining and expressing what love looks like, Jesus does not. Jesus uses these awesome word pictures. So he tells a story of a shepherd, a shepherd who has 100 sheep, and he loses one. One. That's nothing. One percent, right? Ninety-nine percent. I would have been thrilled with that uh, in school. Ninety-nine percent. But what does the shepherd do? Jesus says the shepherd goes off. He leaves the ninety-nine to go off to look for the one. And he doesn't stop until what? Until he finds the one. And when he does, he brings that sheep back into the pen. And he throws a party that the one that was lost is found. Jesus goes on and he says, there's a father, there's a, there's a father who, who embraces his son, this prodigal son who is gone. And, and what he tells us in the story is that this son, son who had basically said to his father earlier, said, Dad, I just wish you were dead. Here we go on Father's Day. There's your Father's Day message, right? Dad, I wish you were dead. I wish you were dead and out of my life. Give me, half, give me my part of the inheritance and I'm out of here. And so the father does, and the son goes and he squanders it all right? Wastes it all. And so the, the son comes home, battered, beat up, bruised, broken. And what does the father do? He embraces him. He embraces him and he holds him and he says, my son, my son has returned home. My son who has lost has been found. Let's throw a party for my son is home. Right? Jesus tells us, he, he describes beautifully what love looks like. Then he says to us, he says, and, and here's, here's what love looks like lived out in your lives. He says, greater love has known than this, that you would lay down your life for your friends. Right? This is what love will look like in your lives, that you've got to lay it down. You've got to lay down your life for your friends. That, then you begin to see what it is, but then Jesus does this. He lives it out. Jesus actually lays down his life, but he goes a step further because he tells us to lay down your life for your friends. But guess who Jesus lays his life down for? His enemies. Remember what Paul writes in Romans? For while we were still sinners, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And sinners is defined in the, Bibles as, in the Bible as enemies of God. If we are a sinner, we're an enemy of God. We're dead in our sins. And so Christ didn't die for his friends. He didn't die for those people that liked him. He didn't die for those people that were, ah, Jesus, you're my buddy. Certainly he died for all people. But in our sins, we are what? Enemies of God. That's who Christ died for. That is his love. That he would die for his enemies that we might be called his friends, that we might be called sons and daughters of God. This, this love, this is the love that the Spirit works in our lives. This is the love that you and I are called to live out in our walk as Christians. The next one, joy. Like most of it, uh, most of this fruit, joy has two parts to it. The first one comes, uh, the first one is the condition of the heart, right, that comes from our, our our, um, our understanding, our relationship with Jesus, right? So the first one is a condition of the heart that really understands its relationship to Jesus, meaning I know I am a redeemed sinner. I know I am forgiven. I know what he has done for me. So my, I have joy because I know, wow, I am a friend now of his. I'm a son and daughter of the king, right? So it's, it, it comes from the heart that knows that, but then joy is also an outward expression of that. You've got to have both. As a Christian, it just has to have both. If we really understand our connection to Jesus, our relationship to Jesus, if we get that, right, that joy, it's got to come out. It, it just has to. It, it, it's, it's a contradiction to have Christians who walk around with sad faces, right? And how many of us walk around that way? How many people do we see as Christians? Bummer, I'm a Christian, man. Bummer, Jesus died for me. This really bites, Right? That's not it. It's got to be both and. It's an inward and an, an inward reality that expresses, it expresses itself outwardly. It just has to. But it's not something we can just produce. We could fake it, right? I mean, we could have Carrie in the band just playing all this up music, and we could oh, kind of yeah, fake it and get all riled up. But real joy only comes from a life that has died with Christ, a life, a life that has said, Jesus, you are now my life. Then real joy is produced, not just inwardly, but outwardly. It doesn't mean you walk around all the time, woohoo, but it means, man, I've got joy, a joy that this world cannot offer. The next one is this, peace. Now, this is both a peace with God, 
because of what Jesus has done for us, but it's also the peace of God that transcends all understanding and our circumstances in our life. It is this fruit that allows us to be what Jesus calls us to be in Matthew 5 when he says, peacekeepers. Right? And it's because we have this fruit that we can be peacekeepers in this world. Now, we, we kind of confuse this. We think, well, if I have the peace of the Spirit in my life, I won't have any problems. I won't have any suffering. There will be no strife in my life. <laughs> Sucker. Right? That's not true. In fact, Jesus says differently. He says, if you're going to be my follower, you're going to have what? Trouble. Suffering. Strife. So this doesn't mean if you have the peace of the Spirit, right? The fruit of the Spirit, peace working through your life. You're not going to have no trouble. You're not going to have no suffering, right? But what it means is we have the peace of God that transcends those circumstances because we have a peace with God. So even in those troubling circumstances, even in those suffering times, I know who I am at peace with. I'm at peace with God. And so this world, I know, does not have the last word. My circumstances do not define me, will not end up having the last word in my life, but Jesus, who is our peace, is our last and eternal word. This is what the, 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 this fruit of peace does in our lives. The next one, uh, patience, or the NIV has it now as forbearance, and it, that's not a word we really throw around very often, but forbearance means patient control, um, restraint, tolerance, fortitude, and, and this word is usually used in regards um, to people. And so, like all this fruit, it's all this fruit, friend, all this fruit. It's meant to um, reflect who God is toward us and how God is toward us. So, let me ask you, as we talk about patience and, and forbearance, how patient is God with you? <laughs> right? Yeah, Carrie gave me the whoa. Right? <laughs> God is very patient with us, is He not? In our sinning and rebelling, and rebelling, is is not God patient? That would have squashed me. Well, what am I, 52? About 51 and a half years ago, I right? Would have, or maybe 51 and three-quarter years ago. Whatever, I would have been done with me. God is patient in our sinning and rebelling. He, he's patient in our apathy and our unconcern. God is patient beyond all means. When we snub his love, God continues to be patient with us. This is what that looks like in our lives, that we would be patient, that we would, we would exemplify that in our dealings with other people, that we would be patient with them that we would not wish anyone, right, to come to harm. Not, not know who Jesus is, but in our patient dealing with them, that they would come to know who Jesus Christ is and the love he has for them. That we'd be patient and forbearing. The next one is this, kindness. Now this is translated as, as concern, right? Concern for humanity, benevolence, generosity, um, compassion would probably fit well here. This is both, this kindness is both an attribute of God and a characteristic of his love. Um, it, kindness, this is the way that Jesus acts towards us, right? Jesus is very kind towards us. So then we in turn, what this fruit is, is that we are now kind to others. We act as Jesus towards other people, right? We are kind in our dealings with them. The next one is goodness. Uh, now this word for goodness, the Greek word, and, and I, I'm, I, tell you all the time, I don't know Greek, but I can look up people who do know Greek, right? So I guess this is a super rare word, uh, and it's only found four times, the word, this word, this Greek word goodness, is only found four times in the New Testament, and only Paul uses it, right? And so it has, like kindness, it conveys this idea of compassion and generosity towards somebody else, um, um, the idea of, like, going, of going the extra mile, right? When you're, when you're not forced to or asked to, but you're going to go the extra mile anyway, Right? This is that goodness. I'm going to go with you anyway. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that generosity. But it also carries with it a sense of morality. Now understand whose morality. Because in our world today, there's a lot of different kinds of moralities, right? Because, well, you can have yours and I can have mine. That's right for you. That's not right for me. That's not the morality we're talking about. It's not just up for grabs. It is God's morality. And God does not change, does he? Therefore, his morality, his moral code does not change. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. This is, that, this is what's encompassed in this word goodness. It is not only God's unfathomable generosity, but it is also his moral calling on our lives. And so when, we are, when this fruit is in our lives, the Spirit is producing it in our lives, we are generous 
We live generously, but we also live according to the standards that God has called us to do, both for our sake and for the sake of those in this world. The next one is faithfulness. This refers to our faith in Jesus and our faithfulness to Jesus. Like all of this fruit, right? We often think, mistakenly, because this is not the case, otherwise it becomes our own work, but we think somehow faith is something I generate. Somehow I, I am doing this, right? Um, and we talk that way, I'm faithful and stuff, and no doubt there, there's that aspect, but faith comes into our life how? Yeah, through the work of the Holy Spirit. I don't just make it happen. It is the Spirit that faith in my life. Right? So this idea of faithfulness is I have faith in Jesus Christ. I am faithful to Jesus Christ. The message also says this about it, about faithfulness. It says it is a willingness to stick with things. Right? A willingness to stick with things, which means, in other words, you and I, we don't give up. As Christians, we don't give up. We don't throw in the towel. We don't say, ah, this world, I'm done. But we stick with it. We stick with it when the chips are down. We stick with it when we don't get the accolades we think we deserve. We stick, stick with it when we feel we're being persecuted or put down or suffering in some way for our faith. We stick with it, right? We stick with the Word of God, and we stick with the work of God that He is doing in our lives. This is that faithfulness that the Spirit wants to and does work in our lives that we would stick with it. Here's what Jesus says about it in Revelation. He says, be faithful then. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Next is gentleness. This is the humbleness that comes from, from submitting our will to the will of God, right? It, it's, and now understand that it's, it's the humble submitting. So it's not just, it, it, it's not this, oh, man, all right, whatever, God. It's humbly submitting and knowing our place in that relationship. God, I submit my will to, you, to your will. This is that, that idea of gentleness. Now, it's not, it's, not, it's not weakness, right? You're not weak. It's somebody who actually knows their strength. You know it, but you're giving it up. You're submitting it to Jesus and allowing him, right, then to work in you and through you to love and to serve others for his kingdom's sake. This is that, the message put, put, puts it this way. Uh, this idea of gentleness is I don't have to force my way in life, Right? I don't have to force my way through things and into relationships or out of or whatever. But I can be gentle. I know my strength, and it's a strength I've submitted to God and his will that he might carry out what he wants to do, the idea behind this. Um, so what we're supposed to live then with, re with respect, right, gently and with, and with consideration uh, toward others. This next one, self-control. Um, think of this as, as an athlete, Right? And, and you're trying to discipline your body. You know, these, uh, these elite athletes, and, and you watch them if you watch, uh, um, you know, sports at all and what they do to, to hone their body, right, so they can be the best possible athlete they, they, they can be. This is that, that idea of between, or uh, not between, but in, um, in the self-control that I'm disciplining my body. If you've played sports at all, anybody? Okay, so sports at all, you understand this. And if you've played sports with, with people who don't, Right? Take it seriously. Who don't want to put in the work, who don't discipline themselves, who, who do whatever they want to do. You've seen the repercussions of that too, right? Either on the team, practice field, in their lives. So think of it as an athlete I'm willing to discipline my body, which means I don't give free reign to whatever desire comes my way. And you know how that is, don't you? You know how it is. If you're not living by the Spirit and every whim or desire comes, you know what it is to follow those, right? You know how it is. They just kind of carry you away. So it's willing, it's willing to, to stay the course and say, you know, I'm just not going to give in to this. But how do we know then? How do we know which one I should and shouldn't go with? Well, here's what Paul says in his first letter to the Corinthians. He says, uh, ask these three questions in regards to the desires that come up in our lives. The first one is this. Ask this question, is it helpful? Is it helpful? Right, what you're going to do. Is it, um, is it constructive? And the next thing to ask, he says, is, is it to the glory of God? Right, so is it helpful? Is it constructive? Uh, is it to the glory of God? Now, we can't ask these questions in isolation, right? We just can't do it on our own. We, we have to do it uh, in accordance with the Spirit, with His Word, and in prayer we ask those questions. Because left on my own, left on my own devices, I want to go my own sinful way, right? I need the Spirit. So we ask those questions, but in, in, in conjunction with the Holy Spirit in our lives to guide us. Uh, we, we, seek self, we seek to be self-controlled because it's when we are self-controlled 
right? It's when, it's when the Spirit works in our lives that we find that, that we, are, we are fit for the kingdom of God, that we are fit um, for our own sanctification, but we see that we, are, we find ourselves to be fit for the work that He has called us to do. And really being self-controlled, I know we don't like that, especially in our, in our society. Self-control, it sounds like you're trying to stifle me. Truly, self-control for Christians is really the way to freedom. When, when, as the Spirit works us in our lives, we are set free from, the, from, from slavery to, to self-interest, slavery to fear, because we know whose we are and we know what He wants to do in our lives. Right? So being self-controlled, allowing the Spirit to work us in our lives, sets us free to live for Christ. So this gives us a... Um, pun sort of intended, a little taste of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. Um, but, I, but I want you to hear this, because as Christians, we're famous for this. We come in, we hear something, we go, hey, that's great. We check it off the box, we were here, and we go away, right? There's got to be more to it. There is more to it. There has to be more than just, hey, thanks, and then go living our own way. We talked about in the beginning, we have to die to self every single day. If we just hear this and walk away, if we just go, oh, we read what it is, but do nothing else, it's like going to a grocery store or the or Home Depot and buying a pack of seeds, reading what the package is, and then throwing it in your drawer. Nothing's going to grow. What do you actually have to do with that pack of seeds? You've got to plant them. You've got to open them up. You've got to bury them in the ground, right? So that something can grow from that. The same thing is true with us. We actually have to be planted. We have to die. We have to bury our sins with Christ every day so that every day Christ can rise, raise us up again that we might live for him. But unless we're willing to die to self every day, and I, every day, this fruit won't be produced in us. We've got to be willing to bury, bury the old self, which Christ has done with it, but every day we've got to fight that old self and allow Christ to rise, raise us to new life, to produce this fruit. Right? Fruit certainly for our benefit, no doubt. But, but for the benefit of a dying world out there. They have been trying to live. This world is trying to live off of rotten fruit. And they're dying. They're dying for something good. You and I, through the power of the Holy Spirit, wanting what he has to offer, pursuing what he has to offer in our lives, you and I have, have the power, the ability, by the power of the Spirit, to bring good life into their lives, or bring fruit, good fruit into their lives. How cool is that? Not my power, but the power of the Spirit. Not yours, but the power of the Spirit working through you. But the first thing we have to do is what? <laughs> One, two. <laughs> We've got to die to self so that Christ can raise us up and produce his fruit. Amen? Amen. That's probably enough for today.